having faith in the moment when you're suffering is the time to get excited. That takes a lot of courage to keep faith in those moments. You know, as soon as I wake up, I think, oh, I'm awake, and I pray as quick as I can, <laughs> as quick as I can, so that nothing else comes in first. Because I know there's going to be a challenge every day. There's going to be a challenge. And some days I wake up and I know there's going to be a challenge that day. So then I have to really pray. And if I really pray, then maybe when the challenge comes, I will be aware of it. I don't know. If that got me through that, it can get me through anything. So why would I give that up? You know, I mean, it, it, it got me through the darkest hour that I've ever had. And then it got me through a couple of years of being alone without my husband and wondering if he was going to live or not. It got me through that too. And it showed me that if I can stay with God, then I can have a, a better, I, I'm a better partner to my husband and I'm a better grandmother to my grandkids and I'm a better mother to my children and a better friend to my friends. And I mean, how can I give that up? Why would I give that up? How was your Easter, Tammy? How was my Easter? We were with Bonnie and Jim, so that was really nice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it was good. And did you do anything special with them? Um, I think we went in a hot tub. We <laughs> sat around. We sat around an outdoor fireplace with them. Uh-huh. Um, in the morning, I walked on Poplar Beach at Half Moon Bay with Bonnie and her two. Rhodesian Ridgeback dogs. Mm. So that's really nice. Good. And anytime I can walk on the beach with Bonnie is a good day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was it was a really nice day. And did we have a talk that day? No, we didn't have a talk that day. Good. So that was also good. How do you feel about coming back to Toronto soon? Um, that's good. I want to see this baby be born. So yes. Yeah, we're we're happy about it. Good. Yeah, I'm quite surprised that's what's happening, but I'm uh, I'm good. I'm very thankful. And, you know, you, you you don't know what's going to happen if you leave it up to God, do you? Mm-hmm. It's always full of surprises. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we know that everything happens for the best, and it'll all work out in the end. Yeah. Yeah. I've been saying to Jordan, you know, George sometimes will say to me something and I say, well, you know, you, he did his best or, or she did her best. And he doesn't like to hear that. So the other day I was reading something and it said, even though you may have done something in the past that was, that was questionable, you know, it, it's, its value was questionable. Can you have compassion for that, for that action? Mm-hmm. And so then I said, okay, I have a different way of saying this. I said, can you have compassion for something that was done in the past? And he said, yes. So I found a a better way to say it. He doesn't like that you did your best. He doesn't think that that's accurate. And so I'm glad that he thought that having compassion for the person or yourself doing something in the past was uh, acceptable. Yes. Yeah. Um, That reminds me of. Um, our Lord's resurrection, because he was crucified, then resurrected, and then started appearing to some of his disciples. Uh, One of the first ones was Mary Magdalene. She went to the tomb. Um, There was no body. She was weeping. And then our Lord appeared to her. She didn't recognize him. She thought he was the gardener, but then Later on, he revealed himself to her. And then he said, okay, go tell Peter and the other apostles. So she runs and tells them, but of course the apostles don't believe her. And then later on, he appears to two other disciples. They run back and tell the apostles. The apostles don't believe in them either. And then later on, our Lord appears to the 11 apostles themselves. And they're in complete shock. They finally believe that, yes, this is the real Christ. Uh, He was risen from the dead. And then he upbraids them, not for all the mistakes they've made in the past, but for not believing in Mary and the other two apostles. 
And I was thinking like so often when we get angry at people, we bring up things that they've done like five years ago, 10 years ago, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And keep on thinking, oh yeah, you did it again. And uh, how can I ever forgive you? We hold on to grudges, but God who had every right to kind of say to his apostles, you know what, at the last supper, a few days ago, you guys were saying that you would die for me. And then a few hours later, when I was praying in the garden, you guys were falling asleep. And shortly after that, when Judas and the others came and, you know, arrested me, you guys all abandoned me. And when, shortly after that, when I was being crucified, no one was there except for John and some holy women. So he could have blamed the apostles for all of that and brought all that back to them, but he didn't. He just kind of like said, hey, naughty, naughty, you didn't believe in Mary and the two apostles or in the two disciples. Jesus, he could have, he had every right to bring back dirt from the past from the apostles, but he didn't. And so often we hold on to grudges. Mm -hmm. And I think he's I'm such a good example. I'm thinking about how people will say, last week you did this. Two days ago you did this. And now again you're doing this. What's going on? There's something going on that I don't understand and it keeps coming up. What do you think it is? What do you think of something like that, where someone brings a, brings a case against someone who, you know, say they're just making the same error three times? Mm -hmm. It's, you know, if someone makes an error once, you can say, well, that, you know, who knows what happened there? And they do it twice and you think, well, maybe that's a coincidence. Yeah. And then you do it three, they do it three times and you think, well, you know what, that's starting to be quite a few times, the same things happened over again. And then to say, what do you think is going on here? I think if you pose it as a question rather than an accusation, then maybe it's okay. Yeah. And I think the intention is important as well, because if your intention is to try to help the person be better, mm -hmm. I think that's good because you're just pointing out that, okay, I realized that you forgot our appointment last week you forgot to buy the groceries on like two days ago and today you forgot something else yeah what's going on something's must is something bothering you or are you is there something on your mind that you need to talk about or yes or maybe somebody needs to see the doctor or, <laughs> right. or whatever but <laughs> you're you're bringing up those things with the intention to help the person versus you're bringing things up in the past because you're holding on to a grudge and you right. can't forgive. Right. And you're bitter about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is you think that the person can't improve because you're bringing up proof that, you know what? You forget so many times you're never going to get better. I think that's very different. Yes. I think that's very different. Last night, we were talking about rule six in Jordan's book, Beyond Order. And rule six is um, try to master at least one thing and see what happens. You know, work really hard at at least one thing and see what happens. And uh, the night before it was, oh, abandon ideology. And that was the one where it said resentment. It was about resentment, and it said, resentment, if you find that you're falling into being angry, um, and if that is part of you finding the enemy without instead of the enemy within, then it might just be that you're in the grips of an ideology. Mm. And so we've been talking about how if you are resentful that and you're not so that your first impulse isn't to look 
to the transcendent for your answers, but that's an, that's an ideology that you're, you've replaced God with something else, anything else. Right? We have to be, God has to be in the beginning. He has to be in the, uh, it has to be God's will in the beginning of every thought and every action to know if that you're in um, the right place, the best place that you can be. And falling and making money or uh, status or relationships, who you have a relationship. If you have those at, uh, as the highest, then, you know, things just aren't going to go well. Mm -hmm. And that's, I don't think I realized that as completely as I did this week when we went through that rule. So that was, uh, that was a, an interesting observation, a complicated observation that we're, I've just started to understand. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, yesterday I was speaking with one of the um, university students that I live with, mm -hmm. and she's been reflecting on her life, what her priorities are. She's been thinking about her purpose and mission in life. Mm -hmm. And she said that basically what makes her happy is helping others to get closer to God. Mm -hmm. And if she is out on her deathbed, she would like to think that she has brought people closer to God. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that the more I can be in touch with my best self, my, my transcendent, the, the less I can be attached to other things, the easier my death will be. And, and that means that the people who are with me that love me don't suffer quite as much because if I'm not suffering when I'm dying, then it, it's not as hard on the people that you leave behind. So it's really, even for that, it's a very good goal to live like that. Yes. Mm -hmm. I know people who have been inspiring to others, even though they've been on their deathbed. Right. It's like dying is a, a very difficult process. Uh, so the former prelate of Opus Dei, his name was Bishop Javier Echevarria, and he was dying in a hospital and uh, he, he had a respirator. It was hard for him to breathe and speak. At one point in time, the nurse went into his room and said, um, Father, how are you doing? And he said, oh, I'm doing great. He was watching Madame Butterfly. And he said, I could sing that opera. <laughs> and she said, she was joking with him as well. So she said, okay, let's hear it. And there was a priest who was accompanying this bishop. And then um, Bishop Javier turned to that priest and said, shall we sing? And then the priest turned to Bishop Javier and said, Father, we haven't practiced yet. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's time to sing. Yeah, he was he was always I was told that he was a very serious person when he was younger, but later on, he knew he wanted to make life pleasant for other people. So he loosened up. He made jokes. And until the end of his life, he was still cracking jokes, making life pleasant for others, making people laugh, spreading joy. Mm -hmm. Well, on this tour, I think it was only last night, George said that he knows that when he's speaking about something that's difficult and maybe also um, not, not just difficult because it's deep, but because it's also uh, shows the underbelly of society or of the human mind, um, he realized that he had to deliver it with humor. Hmm. That the more he can deliver something with humor, the more, I think, the easier it can be accepted. 
And I think that's true, no matter what it is, if you can bring humor to it. It's well, j- j- my, my son says that too, mom. He says, mom, sometimes you say things. If you just giggle at the end, it's a lot easier for the other people to hear what you have to say. Yes. But oh, yeah, that's a really smart thing for a young man to know. Because Julian, he, you know, he's pretty, he says what he thinks, but he always has a little um, flourish afterwards that's, that brings it back up again. And it's a lot easier to accept something. Maybe he won't, maybe he's not ready to do something or say something. He can put a little levity on it and then it's not harsh. It's a, it's a bit of compassion, you know, for the person who you're delivering the bad news to. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I also think that when negative, quote unquote, negative things happen to us, I also tell people about them as if it were a funny story. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if I missed a bus, if I sort of had a bad day, then I would get together with the university students I live with and just say, you know what happened to me? The X, Y, Z. And we would all be laughing. Right. And part of it is like, it would help me accept the day better. But yeah. also, like see it in its proper perspective. Like, right. It's not the end of the world. No. Let it go. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And if we, if we make a tragedy out of every single thing, okay. So what if you failed the exam? So what if you didn't get the job life goes on and there's bigger plans. Mm-hmm. So if we can learn to see humor in these things, I think we're going to be happier. So I wonder the resurrection, because, you know, Christ was crucified, died, buried, and then he, and then he comes back and is resurrected. And the joy that that brings to everyone once they can comprehend that this is what's happened. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a little bit of similarity between having something happen to you in the day that has some heaviness to it and then turning it around and, and making it light. Totally. Yeah, that practice is there in, in that. Mm-hmm. Yes, and the truth is that God makes good come out of everything. Yeah, it's remarkable. Why did, I, why did I miss that bus? I don't know, but God's going to make good come out of it. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's right. When you miss something or, or someone isn't free, then something else is, is supposed to happen. Exactly. And then why did you get sick? I mean, it was unfortunate. It was painful. There was a lot of suffering, but mm-hmm. good came out of it. Yeah, that's right. And uh, having faith in the moment when you're suffering is the time to get excited. <laughs> and that's, that takes a lot of courage to to, to uh, keep faith in those moments. But yes. if you can, then you can notice when the miracle happens. Yes. Mm-hmm. And talking about courage, St. Jose Maria, the founder of Opus Dei, he said that women are stronger than men in the face of suffering. And the example is, you know, at the cross, who was there? The women. There was only one man there. <laughs> Well, right, right, right. John, the apostle, and Christ, but the others were the women who may, who remained faithful until the end. And you were an incredible pillar of strength when you were sick. So you were the one suffering. You were the one who was going to undergo all that treatment, who is going to, I don't know, endure all those challenges but you were supporting your family members. Well, I think that God gave me the, uh, gave me the strength and the courage and uh, what a gift that was, you know, it, it, um, because it didn't really feel like it was on my shoulders anymore. And so who was I to, To take it on my shoulders, if it was taken off my shoulders, I was just grateful for it. So I let that happen. 
I let that continue it day to day, even though I was in the hospital and that, and we didn't know how it was going to go or, or, you know, if there was going to be any help available, uh, that wasn't my problem. That was God's problem. And he was going to take care of it. How do you mean that it wasn't on your shoulders? Like, well, so uh, when, I, when I went to tell Julian the, the prognosis that I was going to die within the year and I looked at him it changed my perception changed so that what seemed to be my decision to tell him what was going to happen was no longer my decision. And it was no longer the doctor's decision. It was God's decision, whether I was going to live or die. And I had nothing to do with it. All of a sudden that just seemed to make perfect sense. All of a sudden, I didn't think it up. It just, my perception, I think, I don't know, the stress of the event somehow changed my perception. You know, the true love I saw for my son, somehow, I wish I knew, you know, I wish I knew what it was that changed, but it totally changed. And then uh, from then on, it wasn't on my shoulders anymore. So I, had, I had to be there and go through it, but... Um, I don't know. It was different after that. It wasn't my, wasn't mine to, I don't know. It wasn't mine to worry about. So if others are suffering, how would you advise them to mm -hmm. feel the same? Well, you know, the outcome, we don't know the outcome. It's unknown. And, but there is a plan for us. And even if we're suffering, we can suspend judgment. We can at least suspend judgment and try to live as if, live as if this is, This is the best day. Every day is the best day. And so for the little things, you know, that you would come to visit and we'd pray the rosary. That was the best day. Getting a little bit of light in my life every day. So look for the light, you know, look for the light, not the darkness. I think that would be something I could say, if, if that makes any sense, to... Uh, you know, sometimes I had some pretty painful um, exploratory surgeries. Maybe the people were tired. It was the end of the day. They maybe had too many people or something, and it just wasn't, uh, it was painful. And those things are hard to forget. They're hard to endure, and they're hard to forget. But... With time, it doesn't hurt as much anymore. And I can look to other things to be grateful for those other things and realize that there's some things that I had to go through in order to get where I am now. And, and uh, some of those places were awfully difficult to endure. But how was I going to get through it otherwise? I wasn't going to get through it unless I accepted those parts of it as well, you know? How am I going to get to the other side of things if I don't accept even the darkest of moments in the moment? I don't know. It's, it's such a, it's such a, uh, it's a spiritual experience. It's so hard to put into words. It's hard to accept difficulties or difficult things that happen to us because mm -hmm. A lot of people rebel and they say, why me? I don't want this. Yeah. Right. Whereas you accepted them. Yeah, I accepted them. I accepted them. Yeah. How? Well, I prayed. <laughs> I prayed mostly the Lord's Prayer at that time. When I was cold and 
lying in my bed with a hot water bottle and a wool hat on my head and a wool comforter over me and I was still freezing, I would just pray and pray and pray until I fell asleep. And if I woke up middle night, I'd just pray some more and then I'd fall asleep. I didn't let my mind go anywhere. I didn't let my mind go to uh, remorse or, or um, resentment or anger or blame or, or uh, pity. I didn't let it go any of those places. I prayed instead. And I still do that. You know, as soon as I wake up, I think, oh, I'm awake. And I pray as quick as I can, <laughs> as quick as I can, so that nothing else comes in first. Because I know there's going to be a challenge every day. There's going to be a challenge. And some days I wake up and I know there's going to be a challenge that day. So then I have to really pray. And if I really pray, then maybe when the challenge comes, I will be aware of it, aware of it in a spiritual sense and be able to accept it and not fight against it, which makes it more painful, right? It makes it more painful. So better to not let your mind go in a, in a direction that is um, fearful and, and angry. It's better to stay where you are with a prayer and have faith that where you're going is where you have to go, that you have no choice. You have to go there. So stay there you're not in, it's not easy in the, on its own so you have to be with god because it's too much for any one person like it was too much for me i just decided i'd die right but then i decided if god was going to be in control well then i could hang then i could hang on to him i could you know i could hold on to god and get through all of this on my own i thought well i'm going to die in a year yep i'm going to die cuz that's all. I, I didn't have anything to fight the um, to fight the disease on my own. I didn't have anything. But when I saw, oh, God is there. He has everything. I can believe in God, put my faith in him, and he will take me through this. Well, then, as long as I stayed there, then everything I had to endure, I knew that he would get me through that. So it just, I just leaned really hard on God. <laughs> I leaned all my everything onto God. You know, I know people who, in times of difficulties, they turn to God. And as soon as they're granted the favor, they forget about him. But you continue to pray. Well, I was old, right? I was nearly 60 when this happened. If I'd been 16 or something, maybe. And maybe it's happened to me before in my earlier life, but not quite to the extent it did this time. But I don't know. This time, well, you know, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But it did. It Well, it, it, it just solidified that I was not the director of my show. And that God was the director of my show. And so I'm going to play my part. I'm going to let him direct. And I don't know if that got me through that, it can get me through anything. So why would I give that up? You know, I mean, it, it, it got me through the darkest hour that I've ever had. And then it got me through a couple of years of being alone without my husband and wondering if he was going to live or not. It got me through that too. And, and it showed me that if I can stay with God, then I can have a, a better, I, I'm a better partner to my husband and I'm a better grandmother to my grandkids and I'm a better mother to my children and a better friend to my friends. And I mean, how can I give that up? Why would I give that up? if everything is better, right? So there's no, no reason I should give that up. And it, but it takes practice, right? Like you said, I haven't stopped praying. 
the longer I pray, the more miracles I see um, and the more I'm convinced. That's why I think we had, Jordan and I had a conversation the other night about ideology because he's always trying to define ideology. And uh, we talked and we said, you know, really, everything. You can, have, you can have resentment as your ideology. And I think lots of people do in this day and age. They always look for the enemy without instead of the enemy within. You know, when we try to run our own show, we're causing ourselves trouble. We need to realize that we are not in control, that God's in control. And that way, oh my goodness, it just... Uh, then you can see the little miracles that happen every day, and they happen every day. You know, it's interesting that when we abandon things in God, things do happen better than if we follow our own plan. Yes, for sure. I've been trying that for 60 years. It didn't work. <laughs> didn't work. There was, always, there was always some discontent in my life somewhere. So I might start in the morning and I might think, oh, my goodness, there's going to be discontent today. So then I pray, right? And then the things come up that are going to come up and they smooth out. They smooth out until all of a sudden I'm in a place where I'm having a hot tub and talking, and talking to you on the, on the computer by the ocean, right? I mean, I couldn't have dreamed that up. If that was my plan, this wouldn't be it. Right. <laughs> but this is good. <laughs> this is good. Yeah, the trees are out there, the sky, the ocean. I have water. I have carnivore chips. I'm good. Then why are we so reluctant to relinquish control? Yeah, that's a good question, you know, because um, I practically died a number of times in my life with ski accidents or motorcycle accidents. And I never, I never turned to God in those moments. Like maybe I did momentarily, but I didn't really, I don't know, you know, I, I traveled with Jordan. I listened to 150 lectures on that tour before I went into that hospital, right? Who knows? Maybe that was what it took. Maybe I needed to study, right? Maybe I needed to study in order to make it. So maybe, you know, the whole idea of practice of prayer. It, it's not just practicing a prayer. It's practicing, it's reading the Bible, right? It's reading the Bible. It's understanding the stories. It's uh, going to church. And it's just the whole thing. I think you have to get in the whole religious practice you have to take part in to really benefit and to be able to share God's word with other people. So, so it's, a, it's a big commitment. It's a big commitment. Why, why won't people do it? Well, you wonder whether all that commitment is worthwhile. I guess, because you don't know if it is. So why do it when you have other things to do that seem, because it's your plan, all your plans, you know, you have all these things to do. Why spend all this time following the word of God? What's in it for me? That must be what they're asking. That's what I probably asked. What's in it for me that's, that's necessary? And... Um, I just didn't, I don't, I guess I just didn't get hit on the head hard enough until when I was like 58 years old. <laughs> Not everybody has to get hit on the head as hard as me, thank goodness. Right? Thank goodness. Yeah, earlier when we were talking about, you know, me knowing people who have been in a difficult situation, who have prayed, gotten their miracle, and then afterwards forgotten God. Uh, whereas you have continued. So you mentioned that 
maybe 16 year olds would do that. They would get a miracle and then forget about God. But why? What is it about? I don't think they recognize it's a miracle. I think that they think that the that they had something that it was them that orchestrated that. And I don't believe that anymore. And part of what I did to help me believe that is to pause, to pause and not react to things. To pray when I'm in discomfort, in discomfort right? To pray, to really pause and to let whatever has happened going to happen. And whatever happens is different than I would have orchestrated it and good. And so that is something that takes a while to learn to do because in the moment people react. And our society, I've said this before on podcasts, we don't pause and reflect before we speak or act in this society. There's a lot of reaction. People are driving or reacting, right? People in, in uh, the universities, in the classes, they're reacting. That, that should be a thoughtful place. You know, the university, that, that ought to be a, a thoughtful place where people are mostly pausing and trying to formulate the best answer after letting it sit for a while and have the best answer come to them. But there's so much reaction now that uh, that blocks you from God. Fear. Uh, and who knows what else is going on with all the interventions we have, with all the medical, we have the birth control pill and um, just so many things that people are doing now and we, we don't know what those things do to us those horm different hormones for different people and all that we, we don't know anything about how that are going to impact us and what decisions how they're going to change our decisions what do you think of the birth control pill it was not good for me uh it made me depressed uh it was really definitely not good for me and uh, I've met other women, too, who have told me the same thing. Not always depression, but, but often depression. You know, there, and there are some people who took it and they never found anything bad. Maybe they had very heavy periods, so they took the birth control pill and then their periods weren't so heavy and they were fine. But for me, man, I would, when I took the pill, I would quit university, stop cutting my hair, stop dressing nice, stop, stop, stop taking care of myself. Then I'd stop taking the pill. I'd go back to university, start taking care of myself. And I think I did that three times before I realized that it was the pill that was doing that. But I had moved from home, gone to university. I didn't see my family anymore. Was in universities seeing whatever doctors didn't have a family physician. So there wasn't anybody like a pastor in my life who I saw every Sunday, who would check in with me and say, what's going on with you? You're different. Something's happened to you. You're different. So there really wasn't anybody. And that's the thing about community, right? That's the thing about the church in a way too, is that you go to church every Sunday and people are able to see you every Sunday. And then something happens, they'll be able to see it. They'll say, oh, something's happened in your life. What's changed? But there was no one in my life like that. And so it took me a long time to figure out the, the pill was bad for me because I was changing groups of friends. I was changing cities. I was changing universities, going on the pill, off the pill. It was really bad for me. Super. Do you think bad. it was just something chemical or, uh, or yeah. was there something deeper? Well, hormone. It was definitely taking, I think, taking the hormone that you take. Uh, I, had, I have no idea what that did to me, but it put me into a deep depression. I only really figured it out when I had, I'd had Michaela and then I had Julian and we weren't going to have any more kids. So I went on the birth control pill when he was a year old and all of a sudden I wasn't getting along with Jordan anymore and didn't have any patience for the kids or anything. And someone came to visit and she said, you know, when I took the birth control, control pill, it did exactly the same thing to me. And I thought, oh, that's what it is. That's bothering me again. And so I threw it out and I never took it again. 
we're so complicated. You think I could have figured that out, but you know, I was moving around. I didn't have any solid community. You know, we need, we need each other to monitor each other and take care of one another. We need our communities. It's important. People think we, we think I was very independent. I thought I could do things on my own, that my plan was okay. You know, I was all self-reliant and everything. That's uh, putting yourself in a situation that's precarious. More precarious than I knew. It's interesting how when we think that we're so important that we can be independent and getting back to that 16 year old who doesn't re recognize miracles, who thinks that he orchestrates good plans. It's interesting how when we think that we are at the center, <laughs> that we're the best, then that's or the worst or the worst, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then we get into trouble. Yeah, we get into trouble. And that's the trouble I think often that we're seeing now is there's a lot of people who are self-reliant now and not, are not looking to God for their salvation. And why do you suppose that they're so self-reliant? Because everybody's left the church, and and, and there's um, new ideologies that have cropped up to take the place of God, and that puts us on top or on the bottom, uh, resentful on the bottom and pr proud on the top. You know, so that it's not good. It's better to be humble. <laughs> right? Yeah, you know, that reminds me of Jesus' resurrection. Like, he did it so humbly. Mm -hmm. He didn't make a big show out of it. It was, you know, dark. <laughs> and, like, nobody witnessed it. They just witnessed the empty tomb. They saw angels but that they didn't see him rise. And after he rose from the dead, he didn't go to the people who had crucified him and said, ha ha, look who's laughing now. Or he didn't say, I told you so. No, who did he appear to first? You know, Mary Magdalene, his other disciples, and it was out of love. Mm -hmm. That's real humility. Yeah, that's for sure. Because I can just think of all those times when I have told people to do things, they didn't listen, and then they got into trouble, and then I said, I told you so. Thinking that we had the right plans, huh? Yeah. Yeah. If you would have just done it my way, everything would be okay. <laughs> but God being all powerful all wise he's also all humble yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it's a beautiful thing isn't it yeah. it really is my life's good even though I haven't been home in a long time and I miss being around my community and my family and my friends and everything, it's so good. It's good. I'm happy to have a, a purpose. I'm lucky to have a purpose. It's been good to be here and figure out what to do, how to spend my days and stuff. That wasn't easy to figure out. But I had to ask God. And yes. then he told me. <laughs> he told me what to do. <laughs> and ultimately, love is the purpose. Because some people can make their purpose their work mm -hmm. or their own ego. Like how many, how much money they have, how much prestige they have, how many people admire them. But I think what's most fulfilling 
is having a life that's full of love, Mm -hmm. particularly love of God. Yeah. Yeah. It's good practice. If you can, if you can um, really practice loving your heavenly father and your heavenly father loves you, then that can spread out to the other people in your life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Loving others because you love God. Yeah. And I'm just thinking of um, an article I read uh, in the newspaper. It was a man and his wife and baby in a car. And they were going, I forget how it happened, but they were going into a car accident and the driver, the husband, knew that they were going to get hit. So what he does did was he steered the car so that he would get hit and not his wife or child. So he died instantly, but he saved the life of his wife and child. Mm. And um, I mean, it was a tragedy, mm-hmm. but at the same time, it was a beautiful heroic act. Mm-hmm. You read that in the news? Yeah, not recently though. Not recently. But, mm-hmm. Yeah, but his wife said um, that that's the type of husband he was. Right. Always protecting, always loving, always think putting himself second. Mm-hmm. And that's something else that I've been thinking about, you know, putting, putting ourselves second, but making sure that we put ourselves second. Because if we don't put ourselves second, then there's other pitfalls. So being being of service to other people is necessary. And that's something that we want and that makes us feel fulfilled. But if we're not making sure that our needs are taken care of, then it's very unlikely that we can be of service as as well as we might have if we had taken care of ourselves so we have to be super careful and some people you know they and women often women often you know we uh we end up being there for our children being there for our husband and um put ourselves not just second but completely out of the picture. Mm-hmm. And that's another way that I've been thinking of making mistake and making mistakes. And that's worth talking about, I think, is what how women will sacrifice themselves for their families. Um, I can, you know, I understand your story about the the fellow who sacrificed himself for his family, that's a very heroic act. Um, and, and as a mother, you can, you put yourself second for sure if, if, when you have babies, right? Because mm-hmm. the baby's always right. No matter what the baby wants, the baby's right. So the baby is first. And that works very well when you have an infant or a small child. But as the children go up, you have to start taking care of yourself Mm-hmm. And letting them realize that mom also has, there's a time that's mother's time and a time that's children's time. Mm-hmm. And that conversation about when that should happen and it should start happening. I mean, I can remember Michaela before Julian was born, she would go into her room with books and sit there and play with books for a good hour without me. And it was good practice for her. It was good practice for her to be able to um, entertain herself. And she was very interested in books. She liked to take books in and out of boxes. If they were little like wooden or what do you call those board books, board Mm -hmm. books, 
maybe there'd be three board books in a little box and she'd put them in and take them out and put them in and take them out. <laughs> just, you know, getting, getting, getting things in and out at one point in a kid's life, that's what, we, what they're learning. And so she'd sit in her room and be doing that. And it would be an hour before she would come out. And um, Jordan and I had decided that Michaela needed to learn to be alone. I was pregnant again. I was going to have another baby. I was going to be really busy. And if she was used to spending all her time with me all the time, and then I was going to have a baby, a baby and then she would be without me, that was going to be devastating. Mm -hmm. And so that part of the, the mother child relationship is really important to get right so that you have kids that are independent and not afraid. And, uh, you know, as a mother going to the playground or something, then you're the, you're the, um, you're the safety. You're, you're the safety. You can always go back to safety. You know, when you're a little kid, you can always go back, you can touch base with the safety for as long as you need to touch, but then you go out again and you don't hover over them. You let them go mm -hmm. and try whatever they're going to try. And then when they want to come back, then they can come back for safety. If say someone else shows up and they're kind of nervous about having someone, they can come back for safety. And then when they're sure of themselves then they can go out again. So you got to let those get, let those people go and be, on their own and not feel that you are beholden to them absolutely a hundred percent of the time. And, and our society, I mean, who knows what we're doing because we're having kids older. And so then moms are, and moms and dads, they have more money. Mm -hmm. Also they're more set up in their jobs. So they, can have more time or they can have a housekeeper come and a nanny come. And so then they have lots of attention from adults, little kids. And uh, sometimes that can be tricky because the parents can attend to them way more than they would have if those kids would have had siblings. Mm -hmm. yes. so they would, right. They wouldn't bump into things as often, but then you don't learn the lessons you need to learn to get out in society. Yes. Or they become really spoiled because they get everything that they ask for. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know what you guys do with your Kintor girls, but they come from home and then they come in, they live at Kintor, right? And they go to university. Yes. How do you guys uh, organize yourselves so that they have as much autonomy as they need, but still feel like they have a safe place there? Um, basically, we let them do whatever they want. We have basic rules. I mean, uh, meal, lunch times at 1 p.m., uh, supper, 6 p.m., we have all together. We have a half an hour after supper, get together with everybody. Um, there's cleaning time. Please be respectful to everybody. I, I think in general, they have a lot of freedom. And then if they want to ask for advice, they can come to the management team anytime they want. Uh, they ask the other residents for guidance as well. So there's a lot of autonomy, but at the same time, if they need support, it's always here. Like the, always somebody is there for them for whatever they need. Like if one girl says, oh, I'm going out for dinner. Uh, does anybody have a purse I can borrow? Somebody always says, yes, what color? <laughs> mm -hmm. So we're like one big family that supports one another. How is it different from the university residences, do you think? Um, I don't think there's so much interaction in the other residences as there is at Kintor. Um, I think it's more, for example, mealtime. It's more like a you drop in whenever you want. Actually, one of our former residences, er, residents, she had lived in another residence before coming to Kintor. And she said in her first year at the other residence, people were constantly texting one another saying, what time are you going to eat? 
because nobody wanted to eat alone. Mm -hmm. The other thing she said was people would just not make friends. Even though there are so many more people there, they wouldn't really talk to one another. Whereas at Kintor, we say, okay, meal time here. You're kind of like forced to interact with the others. And surprisingly, you know, you get along with others. You learn how to communicate. You realize that they actually like being with you. <laughs> so it's very affirming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think in the residences, but my siblings all went and stayed in residence. And uh, it's, it's really, there's, the rules are very minimal. Mm -hmm. But the interactions aren't, aren't formal. You guys have formal interactions because you have dinners and, and lunches yeah. and times to talk. And uh, I think in families, it's also necessary. We used to have Sunday afternoon meetings and we would discuss what, who was going to do the chores the next week. And, mm. you know, so it was, it, it wasn't a long meeting. Maybe it was a half an hour meeting or something because you wouldn't keep your kids for very long, but we had the, it every Sunday. And so you, so you had to uh, accept, you had to say what you would do. Maybe you want to take out the garbage that week and you had to agree to do it. And, and you had to do it. And then the next week, if you didn't want to do it anymore, then we'd have another meeting on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so you could get to know what, what jobs you didn't mind doing. Yeah. Which jobs you hated doing. You got to figure all of that out when you were still at home so that when you go off to live with other people. Uh, I think both my kids, or at least I know Julian did, lived with other kids and they had meetings they had house meetings about who was going to do what. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's community. Yeah. We have responsibilities as well. For example, we take turns answering the door and the phone and mm -hmm. each person has their own shift. Uh, oh, yeah. We also take turns making birthday cards for the others. Oh yeah. So that's nice. We've created this environment where people are serving others and actually, I asked, uh, when I first arrived at Kintor, I asked a resident, you know, you've got 25 women living together, aren't you? Isn't there bound to be somebody who's saying, you know, she's prettier, she's smarter, whatever. And then this resident said, no, doesn't happen here because everyone's trying to help everyone else be better. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Well, I've all, every time I've gone there, it seems that, like a very peaceful place. Yeah. I don't feel anything there that's uh, competitive. Yes. Yeah. And so that that's great. That could, you know, well, you guys have, you have a chapel. You have two, two chapels at Kintor. Mm -hmm. How often do you have services there? Every day. In the mornings? Yeah. What time in the morning? Um, 7.30 a.m. <laughs> and then some of us pray half an hour before. Mm -hmm. Some of the residents do as well, which is very impressive, including during exam time. So that's uh, very commendable for a 19-year-old. How long? So you started at 7.30. How long is the service? Half an hour. Half an hour. You're mm -hmm. welcome to come anytime. That's you and Jordan. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very good, that's a good practice. Yeah. Actually, one of um, the single professionals who comes to Kintor, she's seen our residents and she knows who comes to mass every day. Mm -hmm. And she specifically talked about one of the first year students and said, she's got her priorities in the right place. Like so young and she already is putting God first. Yeah. Yeah, see, it took me till I was nearly 60 years old. I didn't, I went to a public school. There wasn't any prayer there. Um, I went to church until I was maybe 13 or something. Then I didn't go anymore, like lots of kids do, right? Lots of kids stopped going to church. And um, I left home thinking I knew what I was doing. 
and it didn't go too bad. You know, I had a, I made some good choices, but uh, I think that there was a lot more frustration and I second guessed myself a lot trying to be the person who knew everything. And, and that's not necessary after all. If you put God first, it's not necessary. Why were you trying to be the person who knew everything? I didn't know any better. I didn't know any better. I thought that's what you had to do. To fit in? I thought it was up to me to run my own life. I thought that I didn't know there was any, I didn't know I had any help. I didn't know help was right there. I had no idea. And to know that now is, is quite a surprise. And you know, when I married Jordan, he was, you know, we got to tell the truth. Okay, we'll tell the truth. So I carried a Bible around with me for a year, making sure I was living a good life. But I still, I still didn't really know what that meant. It takes a lot of, you got to go to church. You have to learn the stories. You have to read the Bible. You know, you got to do all these things to understand what it's all about. Otherwise, you just don't know. And you can't make a judgment about it either. And so people who, uh, people who don't want to know anything about it, not knowing anything about it, it's better to take a leap of faith and learn about it. I mean, would you spend your life not knowing how to count, right? Not knowing how to read? No, there's no way you would do that. You think, no, 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 I have to, I have to know how to count and I have to know how to read. Well, then, don't you want to know anything about your spiritual life? You have, to, you have to read the Bible. You have to learn the stories. Otherwise, that part of your life, you'll be illiterate spiritually. It's not good. I was illiterate spiritually, I'd say. When I was an atheist, I thought mm -hmm. life was just like that, miserable and empty. I didn't know it could be better. So I think a lot of people, they aren't aware that they could be happier. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure that's true. I'm sure that's true. But it's funny because since I've been, for the last couple of years, or however many years it's been now, um, because you get to a point, if you pray all, all the time, and that you want, that you, I don't know, Make yourself available to talk to other people who are suffering and offer them uh, offer them the chance to have a relationship with God if they want it, right? And I never ever felt that that was an option for me or necessary. I didn't know that that was there. And so I didn't offer it. Now that I know it's there and I offer it, I know quite a few people now who have at least started to have a relationship that is more openly uh, faith-based. Mm -hmm. And that's good. Yeah. You know what? We have a big responsibility to live joy in our life so that people can see us and say, wow, right. she's really happy. Right. How is that possible? Or she's going through a really difficult moment and she's still optimistic. How? Mm -hmm. And then we say, well, or you often say it's because of God. Yeah. Because he gives you the strength. Yeah. And I'm just thinking about my friend who saw her she had she wasn't practicing her faith at that moment but she saw her older brother get married she saw how happy he and his wife were they were both practicing the faith mm -hmm. a lot and she said i want that how mm -hmm. can i get it 
and she returned to the faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it, it, it is up to people to want it. It is, it is up to them, but it's not, I don't think it's a mistake to, to live this way, to feel this joy, and to offer to um, talk about it with someone if, if, they, if they're suffering and they notice that I'm seeming to be living a good life. Mm -hmm. And then I'm happy to talk to them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's kind of like, for example, if you see that somebody has just fainted on the street, mm -hmm. it would be, I mean, I think it would be nice if you were to see how the person was doing. Call 911, even though they haven't said anything about wanting help. Similarly, when you see somebody suffering or going through a difficult moment and they could use some words of encouragement or words of wisdom, mm -hmm. I would offer it if they wanted to listen more. Yeah. And where does wisdom come from ultimately? It comes from God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to worry about what we're going to say. It'll come. Yeah. All you have to do is be there. Yeah. And pray ahead of time that whatever comes out is what the person needs to hear. Yes, that's right. That's why you go to church at 7.30 in the morning, <laughs> right? Before yeah. anything happens. Yeah. Because yeah. mm -hmm. it could happen at any time. Yes. So you have to go to church as soon as you get out of bed. <laughs> but you know what? On weekends, if you want to join us, Saturday, 9.30, Sunday, 11.30. Oh, I see. <laughs> Half, half the day, my, I might have had to pray already that morning. <laughs> <laughs> so Saturdays, 9.30. Yeah. Um, Sunday, 11.30. 11 so we can sleep in on a Sunday. Uh -huh. Oh, that'd be fun. All right. Okay. Great. See you Friday. Thanks, okay. Danny. Thanks, Queenie. Bye-bye.